All right. Hello and welcome to Just Animals Podcast. I'm Elle and with me as always is my dad, aka Guy. Glad to be here. Thank you. And then um, joining us back again on the show, we have Dr. Chris Falks uh, to talk about the naked mole rat. This time we're going to discuss his research. Uh, so yeah, you can start wherever you would like, Dr. Falks. Um, I guess maybe your first research project and what that's uh, gone into, or again, you have full creative license here. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, I've kind of forgotten what we talked about last time, but um, I probably mentioned a few a few uh, of the things we touch on again today, but I guess we're coming at it from a slightly different um, perspective. But wow, the first, um, the first kind of project on the naked mole rats, I guess that was when I started my PhD. Uh, we were looking at their mm-hmm. social behaviour. Um, Excuse me. Before. Um, and also to um, kind of work out what their uh, normal reproductive cycles were like, because nobody really knew that in naked mole rats at the start. And in order to understand their social uh, and reproductive system, um, we needed to be able to kind of measure their reproductive hormones and kind of see what was going on in the breeding queens and in the breeding male or males and in all these non-breeding animals that you know, mostly for their whole lives, uh, you know, 99% never, never reproduce. So yeah, in order to do that, um, when I was um, doing my PhD at the zoo uh, in London, we had a really good um, endocrine lab where we could measure, um, you know, all the standard steroid hormones, um, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, and things like that. And also some of the hormones released from the pituitary gland that you know control a whole right. reproductive system so what right. i used to do and this is a typical kind of science um i'd sit in the naked mole rat room um where we had all of our captive colonies in their burrows of interconnecting perspex tubing and tunnels uh and one of um one of the chambers um that each colony has is a toilet chamber because uh, naked mole rats are right. uh, quite organised uh, little critters, and they have a specific chamber that they use as a latrine. So I used to spend days and days and days sitting in thirty degrees C in this little room in the basement of the zoo, armed with a pipette, you know, a little glass pasta pipette, waiting for the uh, animals to come in and um, have a pee, basically. And then I'd collect their urine sample. Um, so it was completely non-invasive. They could all be going about their normal business. And then um, I'd have a little number um, marked on them with a with a Sharpie pen. So I knew who was who. <laughs> uh, and then um, as they went in, yeah, they'd come in and do a pee. I'd collect it, put it in a little tube and then put it in the freezer then when I had enough samples collected, um, I do like a standard uh, radio amino assay where you can measure the urinary hormones. So um, th- that was, um, you know, the first kind of proper research um, project I did on the, the naked morats. And by by doing that, we were able to plot out um, ovarian cycles in the breeding queens by measuring progesterone in the urine and you get nice mm-hmm. peaks of progesterone um, after ovulation has occurred, just in the same way that you would see in a human um, if you plot, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, hormone cycles, steroid hormone cycles. So, in fact, the naked mole rat ovarian cycle is somewhat similar in length to a human. It's about 34 days in total with a, about right. six days of a follicular phase, you know, when they're the eggs, the oocytes are growing, ready for release, um, and then right. there's ovulation, you know, and then there's the the luteal phase where you get progesterone released. So by measuring the progesterone, we could plot out all these lovely ovarian cycles in the breeding queens, but none at all in all of the non-breeding animals. So they're com- we, that was when we we were able to show um, hormonally that they're completely suppressed from from uh normal ovarian cycles even though they could be old, old and large so-called right. adult animals so they're basically like in this perpetual like prepubescent stage exactly. essentially 
Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Is that until, our, our, our is that first, until yeah, our first um there's like one breeding uh, per, uh yeah, there's a breeding fe- queen. Remember? Yeah. And then how is the how is the queen uh uh pass on to the next generation how is there a process for that or how does that work do you know yeah indeed so after we'd sort of looked at the um these initial reproductive cycles and also in the males as well and we measured testosterone what we what we went on to do later was to um look at what happens when you for example um um, cause artificially a replacement queen to come through so we'd measure the hormones in the colony members and look at the behavior then we'd take the queen out from the colony and um, put her with another partner and then we'd look to see who succeeded the queen Um, and what we saw was it was the uh, female um, in the in the cases we looked at the the next high ranking female um, stepped up and took over and then we could see her ovarian cycles would commence by looking at the progesterone in the urine and also these females that took over as the new queen had high levels of testosterone uh, in the females in other words interesting um you know they were aggressive because we all know that too much testosterone leads to uh, aggressive behavior and um so that was so so it wasn't it wasn't any kind of lineage. It was more of who was the toughest woman around. Exactly. Um, so it could be a sister or a daughter or another individual, maybe unrelated to the queen, potentially. So it's all about how dominant they could be. And so we were able to show the sort of hormonal underpinnings of that as well from all this urine sampling that we we did and hormonal measurements. And interestingly, along along these lines, there was another colony I was looking at at the time, uh, just one of the ones I was routinely studying to to work out the, the baseline um, endocrinology. And I came in one morning, and the uh, the queen was dead, um, and she'd been killed oh, oh overnight uh, since I went oh. home till when I came in the next day. And one of the others in the colony, there had been like an uprising. Um, and when um, when it was quiet in the night, they'd been fighting and the queen was deposed by this other high ranking individual. And then when I went wow. back and I looked at the hormone profiles, I could see that this female was starting to switch on her reproduction um, and um, sort of uh, under, start to undergo some ovarian cycles uh, because um obviously she she was able to escape from the suppression of the existing queen because she was like really dominant and was able to um take over so that was um that was quite an interesting just chance observation mutiny and usurpation in the uh, naked colony yeah, wow do you think that uh do you think that's some type of uh, Darwinian survival of the species type thing? Yeah, I think that what it really shows, and there have been, you know, over since then, other, many other cases like this um, reported, what it shows is that um, within this amazing kind of, on the surface of it, harmonious, cooperative, helping society, that there's bubbling under the surface, There, there is this drive for you know individual reproduction and you know so-called um uh, drive to increase individual fitness so in other words produce your own offspring rather you know than helping a close relative right. to uh, sure. produce offspring which indirectly passes your genes on this um idea of kin selection and uh inclusive fitness you know so right. we can measure Do all the males uh get to have the queen or is there a certain no like, just um so alpha just male. certain males uh, or one male often it's just one male that the queen forms a long term pair bond with and uh, sometimes they can be two and perhaps rarely three males but these are particular males that the queen forms as i say a long term pair bond with 
So in a sense, we sh- we should kind of look at it like like a monogam, pretty much a monogamous system um, on the whole. Although sometimes there can be two male partners, but she doesn't, you know, chop and change breeding males very often. They can remain as breeders, you know, for uh, for many years. And indeed, the sort of neurobiology of um, of this kind of behaviour is quite special um and it's different to like promiscuous um mating behavior you know where the the queen would be mating with anybody she certainly absolutely doesn't do that she forms a long term uh, kind of pair bond um with uh with these particular males and so i mean what we have really in the colony is by and large you know a, a massive kind of family um we believe in the wild you can get perhaps uh, other unrelated individuals drifting in and out as well, although it's not that overly well understood um, from field work because it's quite okay. hard. So then people. after... I wanted to ask a question. Sorry. Okay. This is uh, going to take a turn of the uh, topic. No, no, is... well, I was just going to say, what was your... So after you did reproductive cycles and whatnot, what was the next research area of research? Yeah, so so that, once we kind of knew what the um, what the normal situation was, yeah, we could go on to do these manipulations as we've just chatted about where, you know, if you see what happens when you take the queen out. Um, but also the really big question that we wanted to address uh, at the beginning was, yeah, what what were the social cues that caused this suppression of reproduction you know in all of the other colony members for their entire lives in this very profound way as, right. as you alluded to they're all held in a prepubertal state males and females right you know and that can carry on for more than 30 years um i mean it's absolutely right. astonishing so what we wondered was was it the physical presence of the breeding queen that brought that suppression of reproduction about or was it some some kind of um what what would you would call a primer pheromone in other words some chemical x or x y and z in the urine of the queen say that when the when the non-breeders are exposed to it it, it switches off their reproduction so these kind right, of right. these these chemical signals primer pheromones are like uh, volatile chemical messages that have a specific effect in the recipient animal you know like we know in rodents they can affect reproductive hormones so we looked at that but there was we could find no evidence whatsoever for a simple primer pheromone signal shutting off reproduction and what instead we found was that it was the actual physical presence of the queen that was the the most important um, aspect of the suppression so something um, about the queen her dominant um, position and the way that she goes around patrolling and treading over the top of all the subordinates when they meet face to face one goes over right. the top one goes underneath um, and uh, the dominant one passes over the top so the queen is constantly uh, you know making her presence felt and, right, asserting um, herself and that she's yeah. so far from being like quite a, a cushy job you know lounging around in the nest chamber and not just being royal <laughs> um she actually works really really hard so some i mean some years um some years later we we tracked a colony um uh 24 7 for i think it was getting on for three years their act their movements um, by using the little microchip transponders that we have in the animals to identify them, the same as in your, your dog or cat. And we, um, mm-hmm. we had that connected up to a system that logged all their movements. Um, and we found by doing that um, o- over one like 18 month period, uh, the queen in that colony um, was twice as active as the next most active individual in the colony and actually traveled three times the distance to the next oh wow so they really are working hard busy to 
to be the queen, apart from producing loads of offspring, of course, which must be right. a nightmare. Because <laughs> you know, every uh, maybe 100 days or so, they could be producing litters of up to up to 25 is the maximum. Wow. Um, so being a queen is really, yeah, something else, actually. I don't know yeah, how that's they a, do That's it. a job. That's quite the job. Yeah. Yeah, everybody um, wants to be the queen except uh, when you have to be the queen. Exactly. So <laughs> That's right, yeah. I'd like to um I'd like to ask you a different question and I'm going to I'm I'm going to probably mispronounce a word here so I'll have you help me when I get to it. Uh this is from the Smithsonian Institute uh National Zoo. It says their mm. diet is high in cellulose, which is difficult to digest. Naked mole rats have high densities of gut fauna that aid in digestion. They also regu regularly practice Co coprophagy is that oh, co coprophagy yeah yeah cop cop say that again um coprophagy say that word again coprophagy coprophagy the reingestion of feces which allows them to maximize their uptake of nutrients from their food which is interesting to me <clears throat> I know that elephants will do that to get some uh, certain flora in, a, flora in their intestine initially but I don't think they do it as a regular thing mm. and. I'm just wondering if this um, uh, it, coprophagy impacts their longevity. I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know if that's something I'd it's want to do. It's a good question. And um, people have started to look in great detail at their, you know, their microbiome, we would call it. In other words, all of the little um, uh, flora and fauna living in their hindgut. Um, because yes. it is of great interest um, to, uh, well... Um, biomedical sciences and um, uh, you know many people have shown that our gut uh, flora and fauna our microbiome is utterly critical to all aspects of our yeah. health and well-being you know and it can be affected in humans by exercise um, all kinds of things um, have uh, shown how important it is and you, you know we all know if you have long courses of antibiotics that kills off all your gut bugs yeah. uh, and it's not a good thing at all um so it's an right. absolutely fascinating area of research in general these days but in terms of the naked mole rats yeah they have this um enlarged cecum or the hind gut which is where they kind of ferment all their high cellulose diet as, as you say yeah it's a really um high cellulose um in their, their natural diet so all these microorganisms help break that down um and they're, they're absolutely critical to their health and well-being and maybe they they could perhaps contribute in in all sorts of ways that we don't understand yet only recently have um have people been really looking uh at what the, what the specific components of these these microorganisms are so it's, it's kind of early days a bit on that one but it's a really really interesting area um yeah and the the young so, the, yeah the young pups when they're weaning they beg for feces from the adults in order wow. to manipulate their gut so uh once they're finished with the the, uh, the milk or as they're transitioning to solid food um they're fed um feces from some of the adult um you know the adult workers um so that uh you know so that they they inoculate themselves mm -hmm. no kidding so if you had to in in your total uh, mo naked mole rat experience if you had to stack rank what aspects of their life contributed to the longevity give us the top three or four that you think uh would be the key factors yeah wow um that is a <laughs> super difficult one because yeah, yeah well i th it's good that you say to sort of rank things because it's not more it's not one thing um we yes. i think everyone would agree that it's a mosaic of things that come together all contributing but i think some of the um well, some of the important ones are um, that they they have a low metabolic rate, they have a low body temperature, um, so th things are kind of ticking over a bit more slowly in them. 
they have a sort of evolutionary um, kind of propensity to live a bit longer because uh, in that clade of rodents, they tend to be generally longer lived. So then that begs the question, why is that? Um, yeah, why is this specific rodent so special? <laughs> yeah, and, the, and what makes this specific Mora rodent is special? Just so, so, so extreme. And, um, you know, other things are that they're like super resistant to um, stressors uh, that can damage their cells and they have really good DNA repair mechanisms and uh, a whole sort of host of things like that, which also play into their cancer resistance. You know, so their, their longevity is helped in general by, um, you know, a whole mosaic of of um, factors that stop their bodies aging. Um, and we, yeah, we're trying to unravel some of those um, some of those things. And you know, some labs have uh, found that the some of these pathways that are different. And so, for example, we're you know. We're looking at the moment on a research project with collaborators um, in France. We're looking at the health of their blood, their major blood vessels, because they seem to retain oh, yeah. very healthy blood vessels with age. But, you know, we don't know how or why yet. These are sort of ongoing projects. So normally our blood vessels lose their elasticity. You know, we develop heart disease. Right. We don't see that in naked mole rats. So you know, that would be an important factor playing into their longevity. Um, and, and a sort of very recent project um, that's uh, kind of still ongoing with with collaborators um, in the States, um, uh, in, in several labs where we've been looking at their so-called um, epigenetic aging. So this is a, quite a big hot topic area where um, these so-called uh, epigenetic clocks um, have been found mm -hmm. across all mammals and what that means is that as as mammals and as us as humans age our DNA shows some signs of aging as well and that's in the form of, right. of little chemical uh, groups methyl groups that got that get added on to your DNA in specific places or removed so it can go either way but mostly we ac accumulate methylations in our dna as we age so you can plot uh this epigenetic clock so the degree of methylation with age increases and um in a in a sort of very clock-like way um and where these methylations occur well they could be just reflecting aging in, or in some of these specific parts of the genome, maybe they're contributing to aging. Again, this is all kind of ongoing research. But what we found, well, given that the naked mole rat seems to resist all signs of aging, we wondered, well, what is their epigenetic clock going like? Um, so we we saw but that um, actually they do age that way genetically. Um, so we can make a nice epigenetic clock in naked mole rats. So they do age in in that way, um, in their epigenome, in a similar way to other mammals and indeed humans. So some parts of the naked mole rat epigenetic cl aging clock is very similar to to that of humans. And we could build we can build like predictor uh, epigenetic clocks. Um, that are the same in humans and naked mole rats, um, which is very interesting. So certain aspects of the naked mole rat aging process might be similar uh, to that of humans because us and naked mole rats are above the normal, you know, the scale of um, aging re relative to body size. So we, we live uh, longer than you would predict from our body size, uh, more or less. In, right. Uh, by a similar factor to to naked mole rats, um, so um, yeah, that that's been some really super interesting new research that a big group of us have been uh, been working on, and uh, hopefully will enable us to get you know down drill down more at the genetic level to see you know what 
what's being regulated differently to to enable um, naked mole rats to live so long. So it's a rather is there any, answer I, to your question there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a big question. But a lot uh, of this I, is I, still I have... unknown and, you know, uh, yes, on, ongoing yes. research. But, yeah. Um, have you or uh, any of your colleagues ever um, tried to do a controlled experiment where you had naked mole rats on different diets to see mm. what impact of the longevity? No. No, we haven't, because what people have tended to do is to try and um, try and keep them on a keep them healthy by giving them the same di- sort of diet as far as possible as that they would they would encounter in the wild. So underground roots mm-hmm. and, and tubers and, you know, maybe some, vi- you know, vitamin or mineral supplements, um, although uh, some some of us kind of overdid it in the early days by over supplementing them and it, it led ah. to uh them uh, because their vitamin d uh, metabolism is slightly unusual because they live underground out of sunlight right. so right. you've got to be very careful yeah. about supplementing them with minerals and vitamins because it upsets their normal uh right. you know their normal metabolism and so we ended up with animals getting calcified uh kidneys for example we notice when we x-rayed ah. some animals. So uh, people have really been careful to not mess around too much with their diet. And it's kind of difficult yeah. to, because they live so long, it's not like a mouse where you right. can- right. Yeah, it's a long experiment. Two years. So it's kind of different to do, but I think it would be a uh, very interesting, um, you, you know, to, to know a bit more about that. Um, what one thing I have noticed, though, if you if you give them um, the sort of rat chow that you know you feed um, rats in captivity, this sort of pellet food, um, they quite like mm-hmm. it if you soak it in water. Um, and we occasionally do that if we if we want to, um, you know, get them uh, give them a bit of uh, water in their diet because they don't drink. You see, um, they get all their moisture from right. their food. And we've noticed that sometimes um, they, it's only a sort of anecdotal observations, but they seem to have more litters uh, after. Um, it's Maybe it's the high protein in the diet stimulates a bit of reproduction. So mm-hmm. that's the only bit of changing in the diet um, that I can report on um, that, that did seem to have some effect, but we've never really sort of looked at it properly. Got it. I have a different kind of research question. Have you ever had a um, specimen behave in a way that really skewed your research results or, you know, one just like not cooperating with your research or an outlier that you've had to, you know, account for within your research? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. And in fact, because each colony is kind of within the overall, you know, mole rat lifestyle that is similar but each colony is kind of quite, can be quite different. So um, Uh especially when you try and look to see who's doing what in the colonies. So Mm -hmm. uh, some, a lot of the early research um, focused on these sort of behavioral studies, um, you know, as, as did ours at at the zoo when I was doing my PhD, we wanted to know who did the worker behavior, who were these sort of maybe non-workers or defenders and in several of the colonies you got really nice trends where the small animals did most of the work and then as you got bigger and older uh you you did more defensive behavior and you know less uh less work so you can certainly see those sorts of trends in some colony but then you go and look at another colony and then the whole colony is an outlier let alone an individual animal um and we've found that it is quite variable and the more colonies you look at you know you can see different things going on because it's such a like a dynamic system in their social hierarchy you know you can have different age structures um according to you know how old the colony is diff- a different spread of body sizes um you know right. new colonies old colonies and they're quite um, plastic, we would say, in their in their behaviour. In other words, they can adapt and alter 
So what you might see one week might change the next week. So you can certainly get a lot of variability in what's going on. Yeah. Um, so could you say so each colony has its own culture? Sorry, say again. Oh, sorry. You know, could you say that one at each colony essentially has its own culture? I think you you kind of can do, and even more uh, fascinating along along that line. Um, uh, so, um, some uh, one of the labs in uh, Germany, um, Gary Lewin's lab. They uh, uh, his team uh, there showed that with certain vocalizations that they were looking at. Um, colonies can have their own kind of dialects so oh wow um the way they vocalize can be colony specific and um that can be learned by if uh if you put by, by i think they put a couple of pups newly borns from one colony into another and they adopted the adopt you know the that colony's kind of um dialect which is absolutely fascinating so yeah the whole idea of kind of culture and uh, and that would be really interesting to to look at i think in in more detail but they certainly they vary a lot definitely between colonies some are quite i mean i know from handling our animals some are uh quite calm and chilled others are, are really kind of you know more hyped up and aggressive um, so you definitely see um, inter-colony differences. Wow. I have a yeah. question when you're ready for the next question, which is going to kind of be another left turn here or right turn. I want to read this to you. Okay. Uh, again, same website. Scientists have found that the somatosensory cortex, which is involved in the sense of touch, uh-huh. is unusually large. Nearly a third of it is dedicated to the animal's four large incisors. Yeah. This suggests that naked mole rats use their teeth to sense the world around them mm-hmm. as they've evolved a, unusual physical and behavioral adaptations for their underground habitat. Their brain organization has evolved in parallel, resulting in an equally specialized and unusual, and unusual brain adaptation. Is there any other animal that uses their teeth as a sensory organ? Not that I'm aware of. Um, it, that that finding was really interesting and and unusual. Um, obviously, in in rodents, you know, they're kind of characterised by their big front incisors that they use for gnawing. You know, rodents are basically gnawing animals. In naked mole rats and other African mole rats, their incisors are outside of where their mouth is. So their mouth closes behind so when they're digging with their teeth they don't swallow soil but there yes that this um it was a really fascinating finding and it kind of it sort of built on um uh, what was known in in uh, our normal rats for example where the whiskers on a rat um each individual whisker has a uh, on the cortex a little it's, I think they're called barrel fields. It's like a little, uh, little segment of the cortex that, if you, you know, wiggle the whisker, it stimulates that literally that specific little dedicated patch on the cortex. And every single whisker of a rat has its own barrel field on the brain. So it's argued even that um, uh, whiskers are more important than their vision in a in a in a standard rat even so that sort of approach um and looking to see what inputs the naked mole rat has you know into the cortex where all this tactile information uh is processed i think um you know they have all of these sensory whiskers you know on the face and all down the body and on the tail as well um so i think when they they wiggle their tail when they go down uh, the burrow so it's almost like you can imagine like a blind person using a walking you know using a stick to see they're getting information about where they are in their their burrow um, but the fact that the incisors also had such a large dedicated area of the brain was uh, I think no one was probably expecting that 
and it's very interesting um, finding. Well, it's kind of amazing that somebody had even thought that a tooth was a sensory object. And then how do you develop that hypothesis uh, of saying, okay, stimulating a tooth to mm. some reaction in the brain? That seems yeah. really yeah. like... It is, <laughs> it's pretty crazy stuff. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you know, this animal just nuts. So before we wrap up here, what's one of the most intriguing things that you were not expecting throughout your research that kind of surprised you? What's something that you discovered throughout your research that took you by surprise? Ooh, um, wow. Um, it can be multiple things. We'll do yeah, top three. I, I mean, I suppose the gradual realization that just of how long they live i mean nobody right. is expecting that i think that is probably the top thing that most people would a agree with and that that did come out of it came out of nowhere but slowly <laughs> because it took a long time to right. realize that they they lived to like maybe getting on for 40 years um and i think right. that, that continues to amaze people that as each year goes by oh, absolutely. and there's still a few animals, you know, still hanging on in there. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think that is the most insane thing. Um, probably second, secondly, their ability to resist cancer and other aspects of aging, right. which sort of rolls into to that. But yeah, um, that is, a, that is really exciting and yeah, unprecedented really. Who, who are there pharmaceutical that? companies looking into researching the cancer resistance and longevity of the animals? Yes, yes. So there's many labs um, are, um, you know, super interested in all aspects of that. And, you know, lots of us are all collaborating um, and doing different projects to, uh, you know, to find out exactly what's going on at the molecular level. So I collaborate with labs in the States um, and in Europe. Um, and all over, you know, we we send um, uh, post mortem tissues because when our we have our animals for many years, whenever anyone uh, any of them die, we harvest all of the tissues. I freeze them and put them in the minus eighty freezer. Uh, and over the years, I've div you know collected a huge tissue bank, and th those tissues are really valuable. And you know, we've circulated them to other groups and looked at them ourselves and uh found out some really you know amazing amazing stuff just from a few bits wow. of frozen tissue right wow yeah. well, well with the technology the nowadays of life was yeah right was underground you know ponce de leon was looking for the fountain of youth in florida and yeah. uh we didn't know it was at that time that it was underground, underground in, in, uh, africa. in africa i mean wow. and this, this is well, the thing in so the much. natural world you just don't know what's out there and what you might find right. you know people have only really looked at the tip of the iceberg i guess really and things are going extinct faster oh. than you can possibly yes. study yes. them <laughs> well we we speak to a lot of people and you know with different animals and the department of defense is in, is interested in a lot of animal behaviors and things that technologies that they have uh, camouflaging what was that other one with the hagfish this oh the slime there's a slime that the hagfish produces oh, yeah. that the department yeah. of defense is looking at so it's just i mean all the engineering marvels are are there in in these animals in nature Absolutely, in nature already yeah. and um yeah. with the same with the um what is that not the octopus that other one that does the uh the cuttlefish cuttlefish yeah. it camouflages it it it's it, it's not color it doesn't see color but it it can camouflage in color and texture and in a high degree of high resolution. And it's like, how does that happen? And I mean, how, it's, yeah. it's just miraculous. There's no other word besides miraculous. Yeah. And um, it's a, it's a just like a hundred million years of evolution, I guess, will yeah. do some miraculous that is things. Absolutely mind, mind boggling. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Thank Chris, you. for Appreciate your research your and coming back on the show. We'll yeah. definitely be in touch. And if, if cool. anything exciting, you can come here first. You can drop your scoop first. <laughs> right. And if you happen to know any butterfly specialists, we would like to get in touch with a butterfly person. I don't know if that's in your Ooh, environment. Yeah. but uh, um, Yeah. In what sort of 
what sort of context? Of- well, there was a special on uh, PBS, which is public broadcasting, yeah. and they uh, they uh, were looking at there's uh, butterflies that have these transparent wings. Oh yeah, and yeah. Uh, the structure of how their w- wings are built, uh, the engineering. So I wanted to pursue that a little bit. If we could find a butterfly expert, yeah, let me have a think. If you about just happen it. to know someone, yeah, 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 uh, let me give yeah, drop a, drop bunny mm-hmm. a line. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank okay. you so thank much, you. Dr. Chris. You have a great yeah. rest of your of your evening, and thanks again for coming back on the show. Yeah, thank you. you. Too. Have a good day because um, it's early. Yeah, yeah it's morning yeah. for us. You find uh, <laughs> please find that fountain of youth because I'm interested at my age. Yeah, well, me too. I'm knocking on a bit now. <laughs> Okay. I think working with more right, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully it's um, rubbed yeah. off a bit. <laughs> All right, then. See right, so yeah. if you extract some of their DNA, am I going to have like these giant incisors uh, as part of <laughs> well, them? Then, yeah. I'm I mean, I'm already turning DNA. a bit uh, like a naked mole rat on top. But <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Hey, me too. Price me worth too. paying. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Have a wonderful thank, day. Thank you. Bye, you later, guys. Bye now. Bye.